Well, I was asked about to do this talk. The, the, the idea was about, about um, um, trying to find inclusive societies for people with intellectual disability. And you'll excuse me using that term, but that's the term we use in Ireland. So um, I'll get tripped up on myself if I start trying to say learning disability all the time. Uh, and I thought of this, 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 this idea because whenever I meet with family members and with people with intellectual disability, they say how much they have to fight. They have to fight for every flippant thing. And even when they fight for that, they only get half of what they fought for. And it isn't connected to the next thing. And so they have to fight for that. And so life becomes a fight for them. Um, and I thought also because I'm really interested in the X-Files. Anyone remember the X-Files? Yes. Uh, thank you. I was going to play the... <laughs> <laughs> I was going to play the music there, but I, 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 it's not, I don't have time. And uh, one of the films of the, in Ireland we say films, film is a two-syllable word. One of the, the films of the X-Files was called Fight the Future, I think it was. So I said, let's call this fighting for a fight for the future. So this is an X-File themed presentation, making use of many of the taglines of the X-Files, and those who know the X-Files will no notice them and recognize them as we go through. So it's about, I'm doing this, I suppose, learning from a various situations I've worked in, community situations, and my focus increasingly is, is not on building services, it's on breaking up services and building community. Because I'm really, in my old age, beginning to believe that Community is what brings people together and builds inclusion, not services. Okay? So I'm learning from diverse community settings, whether it's community work with people with intellectual disability through participatory action, actions in Ireland, or whether it's working with people um, living in rural parts of Malawi, where I work every year, or where I've just come from the last week working with people in the refugee camp in Calais. It's all about community, it's the same thing. And we don't have to rebuild a new process. Uh, we can learn from community development work. So I want to try and explore some issues which may be central to non-attainment of inclusive societies for people with intellectual disability. And some of this will overlap with, with content that I covered during the PBS conference earlier on in the year in Dublin. Uh, I want to consider the role of engagement and disengagement because I really think that's a central part of this. It's part of what we're seeing in the, the discussions around refugee, migration, immigration, the, the engagement, disengagement, and what disengagement actually leads to and what engagement might lead to. Uh, and to offer the service model idea as an exemplar of disengagement. And then to suggest ways of achieving engagement with families and people with intellectual disability. So I hope I'll get through that in 27 minutes, he says. So the approach is, as, as I mentioned, it's, a, it's largely an expiry approach. It build, it's built on the idea of conspiracies, because, of course, mo much of uh, the experience of people with intellectual disabilities is being sold lies lies that pretend that things they're getting are the same as what everybody else has got, when, when we really know that they're not qualitatively the same or even quantitatively the same. We offer them education programs often, which we say are certificates and that they're going to be useful for them in their lives. But often the institute, institutes that offer those programs, they know this isn't about them. This is about us meeting our needs to look inclusive. And they get lovely photographs for the colleges in their gowns with the provosts or the presidents at their side saying, look how wonderful our institute is. I'm, I'm quite cynical. I don't mean to be so cynical. But uh, again, it's, it's, it's part of growing up and getting older and getting crankier. Um, I'm just diverting my crankiness away from my children towards, uh, <laughs> towards <laughs> institutions and services. So my own background, I think, is important in, in, for you to know where I've come from. Some of you probably know it. Um, I come from a, a dual background of religion and nursing. But then again, what Irish person doesn't come from a background of religion? <laughs> so uh, 
I, I believe Ireland is a post-colonial country. Don't you know that? Okay, so, but it's post-colonial in two ways. We've got post-colonial part, which was X hundred number of years of what, what we will call oppression. I'm on my own here. Um, but then you have followed up from that with another 80, well, 60 or 80 years of Roman Catholic oppression. And that's a really insidious form. I'm, I'm a Roman Catholic. So I'm not against Roman Catholicism. But it's, it's so structured, our society, and how we thought that it continued an oppressive way, an oppressive approach for many decades after we achieved independence. It's important because the services for people with intellectual disabilities in Ireland were almost entirely provided by religious, Roman Catholic religious congregations and orders. So I, I trained in a hospital in the old system, uh, one of those, and um, I'm somewhere there. Uh, I don't know, if, yeah, you don't need a pointer, you can see. I'm the guy on the right. I, I had hair in those days. So um, I'm the guy on the right um, there. But as you can see, it was heavily influenced by religion. So I, I, I don't, before when I went into nursing, I'd been in religious life training to be a missionary Roman Catholic priest. Uh, seemed like a good idea at the time, and maybe it was a good idea, but we called that formation. And I think that's an important thing for many of us who come from professional backgrounds. We are formed into a role. We learn a certain body of knowledge which reaffirms the role we're going to fit into. And we, we typically aren't well-practiced and well-versed in critical approaches. And so I went through two very strongly formative uh, approaches, which had the effect of subjectifying values, beliefs, and attitudes uh, and practices within myself. So, so there was the subjectified ones, but there were also the objectified, objectified values, beliefs, attitudes, and practices that other people expect of us. So whether that's in the role of being a priest or in the role of being a nurse, there are certain expectations which start building the layers of the onion around the person, and which increasingly create distance between us and the people who we engage with, because they see us as being something quite distant, and some, so a professional, or, or a religious person, or, a, or we see ourselves as having a professional cloak, which is a term I, 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 I did a conference in the state earlier this year, and I used the word defrocking. Anyone from a Roman Catholic background knows what that means. But um, so professional defrocking is something which I encourage. Uh, just make sure you have something on underneath us. <laughs> so I think this is a really important thing because we. Pardon? <laughs> I'm leaving my frock on. <laughs> so <laughs> this, this is a light session. <laughs> Uh, okay, but, but they, I think for this form formative process is really important because it starts us off at a point where we begin our practice at distance. Okay? And professional structures tend to reinforce that. And look, I just put this up because it looked good. Pep Peplow's theory of interpersonal relationships does also say something about that. It says something about the relationships of a nurse and a patient and how values and cultural issues and beliefs about self and others and all those things help to form those, those two groups. And they come together in a relationship which is usually bounded by those values, beliefs, and all the things that, that, that the baggage that comes with their professional roles. So when I look at that in relation to me as a nurse, trying to engage, or me as a person who is a nurse, because I'm much more than a nurse. A nurse is only part of who I am. I'm a human being as well, I hope, um, though my daughters would sometimes question that. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a citizen. Uh, but I come with a lot of stuff, which often is not invested and developed within the person with intellectual disability. Because the structures which allowed me to become resource rich, materially rich, the things that allowed me to develop education 
to valued educational levels were not offered to people with intellectual disability to the same degree. And so I could achieve those levels of valuing, whereas people with intellectual disability in the society which is based on cognitive valuing, okay, that's what we're in now, where we're to, where they talk about knowledge economies, they talk about our best going to universities, but it's the best in terms of their cognition. That immediately separates, devalues, and cuts out people who have that word that the UN Convention uses, cognitive impairment. There's diversity. There's diversity in this room between every single person in relation to their cognitive ability. There's diversity in so many different ways. But this particular issue is central to how we're building our societies in the West at the moment. So when we come together, we come together as in an unequal way with baggage which needs to be thrown off if we are actually to know the situation of the other person. Unfortunately, all that baggage and the regulations and standards and the professional requirements and the police vetting and all of that stuff creates more and more layers which make it impossible nearly for us to engage properly. The process which creates some of us professionals, and we find ourselves drawn into that, socially molded into that, to the degree that we are required almost to use an X-Files tag to resist our serve. But it's damn easier to serve. Because if we serve, then we can go home in the evening and have our life and, and hopefully put the, all those things in the little back part of our brain and not think about them later on. And too many people do that. To resist becomes painful. Because resistance means you have to accept your role, our role, my role in maintaining the inequitable situation of people with intellectual disability. It's not good enough for us just to go into the space, do the job, and go home in the evening and forget about it then. Because this is a, an issue of, as I'll say in a moment, societal inequity. I don't need to go through the history where we've come from and all that, and the, the effect of culture. We've talk, Chris talked about the eugenics. Uh, religion for us is a big issue. It, isn't, it is also for yourselves in terms of the, the quasi uh, scientific, religious understanding that was at the background of eugenics. And then the societal fear stuff is all there as well. And even if we go back and look at some of the writings from 45 years ago, which are the writings of, the, of, of, of uh, Wolfensberger, do you remember, you remember all these? Yeah? Yeah, I don't need to go through them, do I? You want to get home at a quarter to, so you don't want me to go through them. So you see some, some of the things there, the, the, the deviancy roles, the multiple jeopardy, Distanciation was there. Distanciation through segregation or congregation, pushing people away, pushing them into another space. Okay? The discontinuities were there. The de individualization, the artificial friendships, which are still being reinforced by some of the, reg the, rule, the regulations and laws about vulnerability and bland approaches to everyone being vulnerable just because they have an intellectual disability. You and I know that vulnerability is very much uh, something about the inter inter interaction of one person and the, 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 the environment or society or the, 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 uh, the place around them. So we know that. But unfortunately, they get stereotyped as being vulnerable. Something I, I realized quite strongly when, um, when I was acting director of the National Institute for Intellectual Disability in Trinity College, and the vulnerable adults legislation had just cut, was just about to come through in Ireland. And the college decided that anybody who worked with any of our adult students who had intellectual disability must be police vetted because they were vulnerable. And, and I, I waited a moment. Nobody said anything. And I said, OK, what, what's just happened there? We've just decided that a certain group of Trinity students are vulnerable because of 
some stereotype about them, and the rest of them are not vulnerable. And that means that if we want peer-to-peer -peer discussions happening or support between students, that can't happen in Trinity because you can't be peer-to-peer. -peer. You can be vetted to unvetted, or vetted to vulnerable, I should say, sorry. So we start creating artificial relationships which look like real relationships, but they can't be. More of the lies. And then we see, we see Wolfensburg speaking about these things like brutalization, having lives wasted, death making, which sounds really, really harsh and, and nasty. But we've seen this in the last few years. We have the evidence of it, as I'll re refer to in a moment. So where are we going? We're going to these types of places, and we're going to these types of places, but we're still remaining in this type of place. Did I go too fast? OK. So we're remaining at this type of place. And this is a place where, even though it doesn't look like a margin, it still exists. Because we haven't actually dealt with the fundamental issue of inequality in society. We've meddled with service. People have more experiences than they did in the past. People have hopefully better quality of service than they did in the past. But it's still service. And it's still service based on the stereotyped perspective of this group of people. It's not, hopefully we're seeing, and I, I, I hear it within the, the attendee, attendees yourselves here today, and I've seen it in some conferences in Ireland, there are grassroots type approaches coming up, which are challenging the old ways of doing things. Even the new, new models of the old ways of doing things. And those grassroots approaches are really exciting. And they offer real lives. But again, the legislative background makes it quite almost impossible, makes it really difficult to achieve that, that real situation. Because we exist in this space in the middle, but other people tend to dip in and dip out and dip into things which maybe look a little bit like the space in the middle. Are there modified versions of the space in the middle? are the special versions of the space in the middle. And then they go, they, they go back, to, uh, uh, or they remain actually in reality in that, in that line. So we see things happening, and Chris alluded to them this morning, the inadequate access to health services, which is uh, uh, evidenced by the poorer health outcomes. We see inadequate access to meaningful work, and to paid work, and to work with contracts and work which offers people the possibility of having a life like the rest of us. Because if I didn't have the salary I'm getting, I wouldn't have the life I have. My, my, my life needs to be paid for. Inadequate access to education. And in the recession times in Ireland, like we've just come through the austerity, they decimated the, the health service. They decimated the education service. And they started forcing people with intellectual disabilities who had fought their, for their lives to get out of the group settings into individual settings. They started forcing them back into the group settings again to save money. That's unacceptable. But it's a need, they're easy targets because they don't vote. Well, they do vote, but nobody listens to their vote. And to what degree is the voting information given to them so that they can actually vote in an informed way because it's not accessible? Again, I'm speaking from an Irish context, and some of these things may be relevant over here as well. Um, the, the rumors I hear are that they, they, they are relevant. There's a presumed lack of capacity and loss of control. Now, we're still waiting in Ireland for this damned assisted decision-making bill to come through. They still haven't put it through. But they shouldn't have to put these bills through. I mean, you guys have a, a Human Rights Act. It, it worries me if we have to force the rest of society to treat other people equally. Because that, that's, that's not actually dealing with, again, the problems, which are that the rest of society need to be, need to be challenged, not forced. They need to be challenged about what's happening. And we developed specialist people. We developed work-like activities. So a woman came to me, a woman who I, I uh, work very closely with. We meet. Uh, every week or two to talk about things, and she's become, in, become, become increasingly um, control, uh, in control of her own life. She came to me one week, about two years ago, with a letter 
So I'm really angry, Fenton. I said, why? They've stopped my pay. Now she worked in a cafe on outside a service, but it was run by the service. Okay? The, I think the only people who were paid in that cafe as, as employees were the chef and the manager. But the, these people from the service worked in there and they got paid 20 euro a week. Yeah. Um, that's, I don't know how that fits with the minimum wage, but anyway. Um, <laughs> 20 euro a week. So I said to her, she said, this was my salary. And I said, well, how many hours do you work? I work two days a week. I said, does anybody else work more days? And they said, yes. Yes, some people work five days. How much do they get paid? 20 euro. I said, Lorraine, I don't think that's um, a salary. I think that's an allowance. And she looked at me. No, it's a salary. They told me it was a salary. So I rang the, the advocacy group. I rang the unions. They said, we're not interested. Not an employee, not a unionized person. I rang the Inclusion Ireland, and they said, that's not actually work. It's what's called work-like activity. It looks like work. It smells like work. They, people work their backsides off, but they only get paid 20 euro or not. We built special inclusive programs, as I mentioned, which look like the real thing and which aren't the real thing. And we tell people they have rights. And then we see people arbitrarily taking their rights from them when it doesn't suit. So for many people, arguably nothing has changed. And the observations from today, and you've all seen that, and in Ireland we've all seen this, and happily today, because there are six six people going through the courts in relation to the Irish program, which I was consultant for, the, 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 they, they brought a, uh, a plea that video evidence should not be admissible in court. And today, the judge, uh, she ruled that all video evidence would be admissible in this case, which is wonderful. So the, these people hopefully will get the justice that, is, uh, that should be given to them. Inequality is the heart of the problem. It's the central issue. We can't be messing around with other things. It's a social problem. It's about a social system of oppression, which has remained since the days that Chris spoke about when we looked in the past. It maintains distance between people with intellectual disability, including their allies, their families, their advocates. We push them away from the rest of us. And we create spaces where they are but we don't allow real knowing to take place. And that prevents true engagement and facilitates maintenance of the situation, which suits many of us because, you know, I was listening to some of the talks this morning. There's a reticence amongst many professionals and services to move forward to the point where they're no longer needed. Yeah? Because if they're no longer needed, what am I going to do? Where will I be then? Well, you know, it's not actually about me. It's about people with intellectual disability. It's about people who experience inequality. It's not about me. I have the, the, the innovative power to make decisions about my life so that maybe I have something which is still of use uh, to people with intellectual disability. But it doesn't have to be me as a nurse working in a service. It can be me as Vinton Sheeran offering a certain set of skills or knowledge or, or support. And when you look at some of the literature out there from critical theory, from disability theory, um, from uh, critical pedagogical theory, and so on and so forth, from liberation theology, you see a commonality in the way that we've dealt with all of this. The main sort of steps are creating deviance out of people. They're so different to us that they're not the same as us. We marginalize people. We put them together. You mentioned, Chris, the, the word of the colony earlier on. We, the, there's a lot of work from the post-colonial uh, literature, which sounds very similar to the stuff and the things which we experience and see people experiencing in, uh, amongst people with intellectual disability. We control, we've seen violence used, we isolate, and we create obedience. And we do that to the staff as well. Unfortunately, our programs, as, as Nurse, nursing programs and so on often form people so much and the social structures of their workplace 
form them so much that it's very difficult for them to not be obedient. It's very difficult for them to raise their head because their head will be slapped down back into place from when they're being students. It happens very early, and I've seen this with students. Dissonance develops very early in students. So we have to challenge that. In some ways, to quote from the X-Files again, we need to be careful. You get to a stage where you start to trust no one. But in terms of our engagements with people with intellectual disability, I think many of these are pre-configured and predetermined by the conditioning of both parties. And I've alluded to that already. The validity of, um, uh, is also determined by the truths that have become the basis for understanding people whose human diversity is such that their difference is considered to be deviant. So we've been fed so much, I, I can't curse on camera, can I? Okay, we've been fed so much shit, excuse me, that it's, it's, it's actually a, a become a, 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 an embedded truth of how we understand other people and how we understand ourselves. And we may not use words like deviant, but our society still treats people who are considered to be different as deviant. And the service systems, I believe, are, actually, are often based on that. And often they will subvert any questions about the validity of the engagements. They'll say, yes, there is real engagement between our staff and our service users, clients, whatever the words they decide to use. And they'll give evidence for that. But the real engagement is an engagement not between staff and servant service users. It's an engagement between humans. And unfortunately, the structures of service don't always allow that to happen, nor do the structures of society. To distance, it helps to distance the service system from anything which might threaten it. They deny things, deny everything. They deceive, they inveigle, and they obfuscate. I don't know what they mean. It just sounds good. I found it. On, it was one of the things just seen. Yeah, you know. So we still maintain marginal communities. We still maintain global, our, our normalized communities where the outcomes are better for some than they are for others. And those, I believe, are based in inequity. And the, what we do is we send health workers and other people into that space who go home in the evening and live their lives. Okay? And that's what we're, we're conditioned to do. And we carry the burden of others who say, aren't they great? Look at that, I couldn't do that job. They're great. You're an angel for doing that. Yeah, of course you're an angel because you're freeing up the rest of society from taking responsibility for, this, for, for what it almost unconsciously knows. So, and that's based on, on community's charity. So it's a lie. We're, we're led to believe the lie. If, however, we were to change and focus on being humans and citizens of diversity, then the arrow below would, would continue after we leave our work in the evening. And we would be bloody angry. And we would go out and we'd campaign. And we'd fight alongside, to a participatory action, alongside the people who are our fellow humans who we're committed to working with. But service models do die, and we're hopeful that they will in some regards. Not all service models, and please, I'm not painting a, 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 a blacking out every, every, every situation here, but I'm challenging those that, that, are, 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 that fall foul of these types of ideas. So current ser approach to service will die, because there is truth out there. <laughs> the truth is, you were waiting for that one. <laughs> the truth is out there. And when we ask people with intellectual disabilities, what are the things you want? We've seen already this morning, morning in the presentation, a wonderful presentation of, of what's happening in people's lives. When, they, when we speak to people, when we listen to people, when we engage with people, we find out that they want the exact same as the rest of us. And why the hell wouldn't they? They're humans. They want all of these things. They want voice. They want a place that they can call their own space. They want equality and health and support. They want respect. They want work and money. They don't want money for nothing. They want money which, which, is, 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 which they deserve or which they work for, which allows them to live their lives. Here's the wizard. My wizard beats Chris's wizard. Gandalf wins every time. 
And I used this in the last conference I spoke with as well. We need to address, we need to address the distanciation and disengagement issue. But it's not unique to people with intellectual disability. I saw it last week in Calais. I saw marginal camps with awful situations and police surrounding the camp and police carrying out things which they wouldn't get away with carrying out against other people. I saw it firsthand and I treated the injuries last week. We create distance, distance um, and create margins, whether they're physical or social. We create parallel existences where people stray out of thought and time and other things happen for them there which are markedly different than what happens to us in our situations. So moving towards the end of this, I am moving towards the end, I'm trying as, to go as quickly as I can. We, I think we need to start looking at how do we engage in a dialogue, not only a word dialogue, but a real dialogic engagement which bridges the gap between us and the people who we offer service to. And it involves building solidarity, which means it's not just sitting with somebody, it's getting to know the other, to know their, their, what, what is the happiness and the pain to acknowledge both parties, the roles that they both played through actively or even passively accepting a situation and not changing it, but also to actively on the part of the person with disability, maybe passively accepting things the way they are as well because of the, 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 the amount of conditioning and they have experienced. It's about us working together, reaching a point of knowing. It means professional defrocking, as I mentioned earlier on recognizing one's role, recognizing the other as a person, not as a member of an abstract category, recognizing injustice and naming injustice, recognizing deprivation of voice. You remove somebody's voice and you, I, th I think you actually remove their power and their ability to have any control over their lives. The exploitation, the lies, T speak, speak of the lies. They're all out there. Speak of them. Also, the situation of vulnerability needs to be challenged. And it means not just solidarity, but moving into action. Because Freire would say that affirming the humanity of others and their freedom must involve action. Because doing nothing tangible, once you enter into solidarity, is a farce. If you enter into solidarity, you must act. But solidarity is hard because it threatens us. We, we think, but well, what about our role? I've trained for so many years. I've done so many courses. What if I enter into this space? What, what do people think of me? Yeah, sometimes you find yourself excluded by others because you position yourself with those in the margin. And others will try and push you into the margin. But that's part of the process of solidarity. And it's easier to maintain a status quo where I'm the nurse and you're the patient, where I'm giving and you're taking, where I'm being active and you're being passive, where I'm the adult and you're the child, or where I'm powerful and you're powerless. We need to defrock, divest ourselves of the barriers to dialogic engagement. The issues do, can change, I believe, because they exist, because they're rooted in local and global societies in the same way as other roots, forms of oppression are, are become so rooted. And unless we start to address the issue at that level, that basic level, nothing's going to change. So all we'll see is a change in facade. But I really do want to believe. Uh, <laughs> I have this poster in my office. I do want to believe. I, want to I wanted to believe, Fox Mulder said. I don't have the uh, year and the page number. I wanted to believe, but the tools have been taken away. The tools are there. We can't give up. We have to work with our fellow humans. And the work we need to do is based on a utopianist, an idealist perspective. I'm reading this philosopher at the moment. Um, he was a, a Jesuit philosopher who was slaughtered, murdered and, um, in El Salvador, uh, along with a large number of his colleagues, about eight or nine of them, and um, the housekeeper and the housekeeper's daughter. They were all shot at the university in, in, in uh, San Salvador. But he, he was a utopianist. He really believed that things can change. And he said only utopianism and hope will enable us to believe and give us the strength to try. 
together with all the world's poor and oppressed people to try to reverse history, to subvert history, and to move it in a different direction. And that direction should reach a point, and Chris again alluded to this, he talked about the ordinary life, to the idea that nothing important happened today. Because too many important things go in, in, the, in the documents and the, and the so-called charts and the, 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 the care plans, the things that we think are important that happens in people's lives. But they're not really important. Most of our lives, nothing important happens. We just live our lives and our lives go on. Just a final thought, and I will finish on this slide because this is my, my last slide, except for the thank you one. Um, I'm sorry for keeping you five minutes over time. Uh, I, I met this gentleman and his son last week, well, this week, in Calais. And he, they were walking through the mud bath, that, is, that are the roads in, 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 in the camp. And I saw this young man, and I went to the gentleman, he's from Syria, and I said, uh, I, I, I pointed to his son, and, he, and he, he tried to explain, he didn't speak English, he just did this. And so I got an interpreter and we started talking. And I found that he had traveled 4,000 kilometers with his son, leaving his wife and daughter at home. When I asked him why did he do that, he said, because I want to get the best possible service from my son, so that my son can become the person he wants to be and needs to be. He can become. But that's the exact same thing as any parents here will say about their children. He wants this to get the service for his child. I want to get, for my, my four daughters, none of whom have intellectual disability, but I want them to achieve what they can achieve. He was so committed to his son. I don't know how he got him here, because that journey is awful. Uh, we heard, we've got in touch with a number of people. He wants to come to the UK. I said, come to Ireland, please. <laughs> he wants to come to the UK because he heard, he saw a, a, a documentary about intellectual or learning disability services in the UK uh, on television in Syria, and he, he heard that the best services were over here. And I said, well, there's good services in Ireland as well. I want to go to the UK. So we're trying to work out something and see what we can do. And any support that can be obtained, if, if you're interested, I'd really like to try to see if we can contact whoever can make this happen. But we've managed to get him removed from the camp with his father to a bed and breakfast. So he's in a better situation than he was in. But it's, it's just, it's, it's heartbreaking. He's the second person with intellectual disability we know about in the camp who's, who, who, who's been, we've, has been, we've managed to get uh, moved to a safer place. So thank you.